paywalls and PSBs. A new dawn for sport on TV, where we'll be discussing what the new model for sport on TV might look like post pandemic. I'm Ina Rizuki and I'll be your host for today's session. And we have an absolutely incredible lineup for you today, who I'll introduce you to in a minute. But before I do, there is an opportunity to ask questions. So please use the option on your screen. Right, let's get to the panel. And it's so exciting for me to present to you, first and foremost, Philip Burney, who is head of TV sport at the BBC, where he is responsible for all the fantastic coverage that millions of us enjoy regularly across BBC channels, including the Olympics, the World Cup, Match of the Day, Wimbledon, and much, much more. We also excitingly have Andrew Georgiou, who's the president of sports at Discovery and responsible for all of Discovery sports businesses, including the recent launch of Sport on Discovery Plus the Olympic Games, Global Cycling Network, Discovery Sports Events, and sits on the board of Formula E. His coverage is watched by over 130 million people worldwide every single month. Now, I'm a fan and I'm sure you are too. We have Dawn Airy, who is a veteran of the TV industry, having held, having held senior roles at Sky, ITV, Channel 4, and Channel 5. She is now chair of Barclays FA Women's Super League and the FA Women's Championship. And of course, we have with us, excitingly, Eddie Hearn, who is chairman of Matchroom Sport, where he leads the UK Matchroom Boxing, Matchroom Boxing USA, Professional Darts Corporation, PGA Euro Pro Tour. Oh my God, it's just never ending. And Matchroom Media Businesses. In 2018, he agreed a historic $1 billion deal with the streaming platform DAZN to stage 16 fights a year across America. Hello to you all. How exciting for you to be on. It's Bear. Morning. All right, morning. Morning. Uh, it seems very early, poor thing for Eddie Hearn, who is in New York, and the rest of us are freezing, I imagine, here in the UK. <laughs> right, should we jump straight in and we're going to be discussing the importance of sport within society and the role of TV. Now, as we all know, sport plays a significant cultural role within society as well as helping to keep the nation healthy. However, the way that sport's been covered on TV has changed in recent years. What impact might this change be having on the UK? Now, really what essentially it is I'm asking is what is the link between watching sport on TV and sports participation? What effect does putting sport behind a paywall really have on grassroots participation? Philip, I wanna to come to you. Do you have any examples of where sport on the BBC has driven participation? Yes, and putting it the other way around rather than putting it behind a paywall, I think it's more a question of, of, of what sport can achieve when it is it's more readily available there's obviously a mixed economy in, in sport boxing which we're going to talk about and, and 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 one that works pretty well overall but when um there is the opportunity for everybody to access sport and everybody to see it and, and consume it uh, it's pretty clear that does have a positive effect there are a couple of really clear examples of that netball's um quite a celebrated one from the England netball success um, first in the netball world cup and then in the uh, in the commonwealth games um, where uh, there was English netball said they another 160,000 uh, Britons start, started playing netball off the back of the of the world cup and 130,000 more off the back of the commonwealth games so really significant numbers of actual active participation and then there's just the fact of the the obvious fact of the reach when it's uh, when it's universally available um and the key example of that again is 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 the hundred being launched this year you know the big cricket initiative obviously free to wear getting re-engaged in cricket it did a bit last year but a lot more this year with the hundred um and 16 million watched the hundred on tv uh, this year over half 57 percent had had not watched ecb cricket on tv before so it's a huge jump in those who are now able to watch um live cricket and the opening women's match, you might recall, broke all records for uh, for a consumption of women's games. So again, just very large numbers of those actually actually accessing it. Um, 
And women's football has been a huge success story, obviously. And that's, I think we'll talk about a bit more, I'm sure, with Dawn and others about how that has grown exponentially in the last few years. And we're sure we can keep growing with the, obviously the Euros in England next year. Um, and the success story there is pretty remarkable. We saw the huge growth, obviously, in the last World Cup with figures of uh, nearly 12 million watching England semi-final. Um, but the WSL, which we're delighted, we now got live matches of the WSL on the BBC to add to our regular highlights we've been having previously. I mean, that's really jumped. The, the total reach um, in, in the last few years, uh, between 17 and 21, was um, 1.4 million for women's football. And this year alone on the BBC, it's got um, nearly 8 million, reached nearly 8 million. So, um, and about 90% of those have not have not watched women's football um, before. So. Um, there's just there's just some just some stats and examples of, 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 of firstly the point that obviously if you've got universal reach then everybody can watch it and and there are some clear statistics to show that out of those watching more do take up the game obviously there's a proportion of those not everybody but a proportion of those will take up the game so we think there is a clear correlation as i say in that mixed economy when you allow certainly or it's possible for some events to be available for everybody to watch um that you will get certainly greater consumption but also greater participation dawn how important is free to air access for women's football and participation um well it's just 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 following on from what you heard there absolutely uh, critical and one of the one of the opportunities and challenges um, that women's football have is that combination between needing revenue but needing reach and you have to balance have to balance the have to balance the two um, and the recent uh, ITT that was put out that resulted in matches being on the BBC and on Sky and on ITV was very much focused on we need to drive money into the game but this but we absolutely want engagement and to get engagement you do actually need that free to air um, uh, opportunity um, and you know you've heard you've heard the statistics I mean what's also extraordinary is that the number of people who are actually is predicted who are going to watch who will have watched female sport uh, on UK television the television this year has gone from 27 million in 2019 to the to 51 million people, which is pretty much everybody um, wow. in the country will have seen some women's sport. And that will be the combination of pay and, and free to air. And to be honest, we, we when we look at the women's game, which is still developing and merging, and it's a, a success story, but it's only just beginning. It is absolutely critical, certainly for the FA and our thinking uh, around um, the, the Super League and the Championship and indeed all football is if you can't, you know, it's that it's that classic, if you can't see it, you can't be it. We want young women to see, actually, you can play football at a very high level um, and you can make a really good career out of it. Um, and being able to see it is is a really important, of that important part of that journey. From little girls in school, having the opportunity and wanting to play grassroots football, whether it's a local wild council in their primary school and there's a whole separate uh, a debate, and I'm sure we'll come to that, about uh, edu um, edu edu sports education in schools, which is woefully lacking, which is an issue, which is why also that having really good coverage, really good reach, that uh, is important to show young girls the opportunity sport can offer them as a career, not only on the grass, but indeed the heart too. So free to access is there to inspire people. And so that makes a good point, Eddie. In boxing has been predominantly behind a paywall for some time. Do you think that this has affected participation? Uh, I don't actually. I, I agree with everything that, um, uh, that's been said. I think for, for sort of emerging sports um, or sports with a lower social interaction level in terms of social media and digital media, I think that, of course, every time um, free to air uh, coverage and, and um, will, will boost participation levels in sport, it's, it's absolutely a given. But I think what we've had to do across sports that haven't had that terrestrial coverage is work harder in terms of our digital and our social content. Boxing particularly is a sport where, you know, we've seen with our broadcasters that its digital numbers, you know, are, are behind Premier League football. And that's about it. And I feel like the audience, when you're talking about grassroots development and that younger generation of, of participants, we can engage with them across those platforms and across that way in, in which you know, they're, they're, they're digesting content differently. And I think 
we have to work harder across those sports to, to do that and to interact across those kind of platforms. Because of course, it's a given that the exposure given to a sport is less when it's behind the paywall. It's, that's just, you know, that's natural, but we have to work harder. And we've done that very well in boxing over the years because we haven't had you know, the, the blessing of huge terrestrial coverage in boxing. And we'll come on to the main reasons why later. So we've had to work hard in terms of content in, current, in terms of its digitalization and its social interaction across across that media. And, and I don't think it has affected the sport in terms of its participation levels. Stars are what drives participation levels at grassroots. People like Anthony Joshua, people like Tiger Woods. And also don't forget boxing does have the blessing of the Olympic uh, Olympic boxing being aired on across the, the BBC, which is fantastic. And you know, we, we have a great relationship with terrestrial broadcasters like the BBC who cover our events as well, whether it's across BBC Sounds, whether it's across its Five Live radio coverage as well, um, documentaries, you know, we've had Anthony Joshua documentaries air in the build up and fight week of fights. And, and anytime we can get that, it's huge for our sport as well. But I think if you don't have that within your right schedule, you need to work harder in terms of interaction, interacting with the younger generation. And we do that across our digital offering. Right. We've talked about how it, you know, sports can inspire and how we can get people to engage with it. But Philip, I appreciate it might be difficult for the BBC to comment on this exactly, but just how important is what you do in terms of getting the nation active? Um, we think that's a really important part of what we're about as a, as a, as a public service broadcaster, which are pub publicly funded. We think that's really crucial. We need to do that, obviously, in partnership with sporting bodies. You know, we're not driving the sports that's obviously responsible to the sporting bodies and we don't we don't have that presumption but in terms of uh, encouraging it and and pushing for it as i was saying earlier those those large figures we hope that enough people get in uh, are consuming the output and then within that we're very keen uh we had a big get inspired campaign from the back of the 2012 olympics for example very keen to have initiatives which can really encourage people um to get out and 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 get active and um in, in all kinds of ways and then indeed to play the sport that are necessary so yeah we think that's a really crucial part of, of what we do um, we think it's uh, it, it's something that we will keep on promoting um, and uh, and I think there's been some really key results there you know couch to 5k is an initiative we've had which has got a lot of people up and running uh, including during the pandemic actually had a really big success story so there's there's some really good initiatives of where um, we've we've combined actually a lot of time with with governing bodies um, uh, the, the People's Cup and the FA, for example, is a really big success story as well in terms of getting um, all kinds of different groupings playing football and culminating in, in a big event around the FA Cup final. So uh, we're, we're really keen on those initiatives. We absolutely regard it as part of our responsibility because of the way we're funded that we should do that. And, um, and we'll keep on pushing in that direction too. Okay, moving on, we've recently witnessed Emma Raducanu win the hearts of the nation with her US Open triumph. However, had Channel 4 not struck an 11th hour deal with Amazon, this historical event may have been missed by the majority of the nation. The list of UK listed events now dates back to 1996 and currently lacks league football, boxing, overseas cricket tests and more. Collaboration between subscription broadcasters and PSB appears to be on the rise. Now, the Olympics, obviously, BBC, I want to come to you, um, Andrew. We saw the BBC and Discovery share the rights for the Olympics. There was a fair amount of backlash in the UK due to the reduced free coverage on the BBC. Now, how was it working together and do you think it was a success? I think it was a success. And just adding to the previous conversation a little bit, I think we've got to also distinguish between where the audiences consume their content. And it's not one or the other, right? This is this is a collaboration that actually grows audience. And we see audiences who quite frankly don't consume their content on the BBC. Younger audiences don't watch as much free-to-air television as older audiences. So so the idea that this is either or, I think is a little or can be a little bit misleading because we talk about you know, free to air networks being, you know, important. A absolutely. Just as Eddie said, you know, that they have 
a big user base that come back to free to air networks to consume content. But there are other networks, other platforms, where you have audiences that don't consume their content on in that place that also need to be served. And, and what we saw during the Olympics, for example, is not, not just in the UK, but right across Europe, us working with free to air broadcasters, PSBs, where we, b between the two of us, actually grew the audience. We had 375 million unique Europeans engaged with the Olympics. 200 million of those were on PSBs, free-to-air broadcasters in each of the local markets that actually engaged with content, quite frankly, where they have been used to seeing that content. And let's face it, the Olympics has, you know, we're used to going to the BBC to watch the Olympic Games, in this country at least. But we also, through our own networks, Discovery Zone platforms, added 175 million additional unique individuals who engage with the content. So the two working together actually can really help grow the audience. I do concede, and maybe Philip can talk to this as well, could we have done a better job to help communicate to the British public where they could see some of these things? Probably, I, I, I do concede that. But you know the content is easily accessible both on the BBC and across all discovery platforms. So I think the combination of the two actually does address audience segments that you know either on our own we couldn't possibly address. So I think I think they are complementary. So I guess what it is is that it's about collaboration, and you need each other in order to move forward. Dawn, would you say, uh, or Eddie, is that ideally what you would want from your sports, the best of both worlds in, in terms of scale and funding? Certainly, with an emerging sport like women's football, is absolutely essential. Um, and, um, you know, as, as has just been said by Andrew, I think what, we've, what we're all working towards, and as, you know, as Eddie has referred to as well, is we're, 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 there's a mix, there's a, so many routes to market. Um, that we now have and there's so many different levels of engagement that is required and we look at gen z um and we know that they want short clips they're very very unlikely to sit and watch necessarily a whole match so how do you give them clips how do you give them features you know around their stars so it's multiple multiple routes to market and there is there's the opportunity for everybody to get engagement to, to make money and i think you know what channel four did um, um, for example, over the uh, Emma Raducanu and what was done, like you said, with the BBC and Discovery for the Olympics. At first, you thought, well, and I was a viewer, I watched it, I thought, well, wait there, I want all of this on the BBC. If I'm used to it, it's easy to find, I can't. But because we wanted to find it, we worked out where to get it from Discovery and still see um, you know, certain, certain selected um, uh, sporting events um, that was covered on, on the BBC. So you've got to work a bit harder, but people accept that. And I think actually, the exciting thing about the world we're in now is you sort of think things have plateaued and actually realize there's so many so many opportunities so many touch points to get engaged and have a deeper engagement with the sport that you enjoy in life you just got to work a little bit harder to find it but the rewards are greater than just good old-fashioned linear on one channel yeah I, I do i do agree with that and of course we will come on to the subject of generation z because how you actually try to bring them on board and engage with them is, is changing as generations, you know, obviously change. But Eddie, let me come to you. Sporting bodies, you know, are currently reliant on sense prevailing when landmark occurrences arrive, but is something more formal required to maintain the prominence of certain sports and key cultural moments. We're possibly experiencing the height of British heavyweight boxing. How do you feel just about the fact so few people are seeing these historical fights live? 17.5 million tuned in to watch Chris Eubank versus Nigel Benn back in 1993. Should we not be seeing these figures now for Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua and Dillian White? Well, that was also a matcher and promoted event back in 1993, as my dad always <laughs> reminds me about. Uh, and that he always reminds me about that audience as well when we tell him, you know, the, the substantial subscription or pay-per-view numbers from the heavyweight fights. Um, I think as... You know, we're a little bit in the middle of, you know, sometimes a governing body, sometimes a representative of athletes. And we do have a fiduciary duty to maximise the revenue and the earnings for those individuals, especially when they're fighting, especially when it's boxing. And ultimately that comes, you know, that, that significant revenue comes from, um, you know, a, a broadcaster from behind the paywall, whether that's a subscription, whether that's across pay-per-view. And 
in an ideal world, we keep talking about, you know, and Dawn said about having the best of both worlds. We need to be able to, the way that you grow the sport in terms of the elite end to make the, best, the biggest and best fights is to generate as much money as possible to pay these individuals for being in those generational and those iconic moments. And that's not possible through rights generated through um, you know, a, a PSB or, or, or you know, from, from a, a terrestrial broadcaster. If it was, and we could generate an audience of 17 million, 20 million for Anthony Joshua against Tyson Fury, and they want to pay the equivalent rights fee generated across pay-per-view, it would be quite an easy decision uh, for a rights holder. But, you know, we need to live in, in reality, especially across boxing and say that, you know, the, the elite end of talent and, and, and stars, you know, we're under pressure to deliver prize money, to deliver appearance fees. And that comes across generally in the form of rights fees from, uh, from broadcasters behind the paywall. But at the same time, we can't ignore you know, we can't just ignore an audience that, that perhaps doesn't exist that would do behind a terrestrial broadcaster. So in, in the likes of Anthony Joshua, and, you know, you talk about his, the, the growth of Anthony Joshua as a brand, if you like, that has been done with all his fights being behind the paywall. Um, and he's yeah. arguably one of the biggest sports stars in the country. So, but that's been done with clever marketing, with association with major brands like Under Armour and Lucasay. And it's also been done across content and shoulder programming, tie-ups and, and partnerships with the BBC and with other broadcasters as well. So it, it makes the job harder, but also I'm a bit conflicted because our job is to generate as much money for the athlete as possible. And we're, we're under pressure to do that, particularly in boxing. Well, actually, I think that brings us nicely to, to women. I mean, we recently saw 1.5 million tune into the opening weekend of the Women's Super League fixtures, while the US Open Women's Tennis Final saw 12.9 individuals tune in. Women's boxing's on the rise, women's cricket's growing from strength to strength, and we saw strong numbers at tuning in to the 100. Dawn, is women's sport finally getting the prominence it deserves? Oh, well, we've got a long way to go, but we're, we're certainly on the on the escalator that's going upwards. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is sort of extraordinary. If I look at just women's football for a moment, that it's the fourth most watched league in the country, you know, behind the Premiership, the Championship and then Cricket 100. I mean, who would have thought that? I mean, just sort of staggering. And as Philip said, it's it has been a journey that's had a sort of an army behind it and you know, particularly the FA and, and the clubs to, to drive all forms of football, but particularly the top end, the professional league and the, um, and the championship. Um, and I think the turning point was, as you said, um, Philip, was the 2018 World Cup when you know, England played uh, the US and 12 and a half million people tuned in. And you suddenly realise, actually, this is, these are, really terrific athletes playing a fantastic game of football I mean there were various caricatures previously of women playing football but these these this is these are proper proper athletes and it's entertaining and it's engaging and it's characters and it's they're increasingly household names but the actual amount of coverage that is given to women's sport and if you look in terms of broadcasting in total is tiny I think it's sub 10 percent of all broadcast hours is, is focused on women's sport now. And it's not because women's sport isn't good. Uh, it's very good. Um, it just hasn't been valued as, as, as significantly as, as men's sport. And if you look at the projections for women's sport in terms of both participation, engagement, um, and investment, it is about to, to be very, very, very significant, probably higher growth than you'll see uh, in the men's game. And with that, inevitably will come uh, increase in coverage as it's increasingly professionalized, as there's more money coming into the game, as more people coming uh, to participate, um, as well as uh, as well as watch. You know, so that virtual circle and all that starts working, it starts attracting more money. So it's it's on the cusp, I think, of being a very, very, very um, significant um, uh, industry and that's got to be good because it's also going to result in back to where we started this conversation about getting younger women more active which we all know the benefits of uh, of being um, you know, um, uh, of being active you know, both mental physical uh, and in terms of what in, you know, in terms of what it does for you uh, as an individual for your for your for your wellness and, and mental wellness so yeah there's a there's a massive opportunity we've come along we've come a long way 
but it really is at the sort of we're at the foot you know we're at the foothills of a uh, and aiming for a major peak okay so massive opportunity the trajectory is really positive philip bernie how competitive is the bidding for women's sport amongst broadcasters now being a lot more competitive <laughs> that's for sure as, as as dawn's very well described that's because of the growth and uh, you know i think and I, that women's football is the single biggest growth sport in the country bar none you know above everything you know male or female i just think that's the the, the growth is extraordinary and growing and and you know th there's a market isn't there there's 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 commercial realities here and the fact is as a sport grows and gets more popular gets more interest more people wanting to view it clearly there will be more competition from broadcasters uh, across the spectrum wanting to show it and that's the fact so it's definitely getting more competitive particularly as i say in women's football in other sports too i mean dawn's right there's still some way to go in all this and you know bbc's very keen we've been there from the outset trying to push women's sports i think um from from years back and and, and we'll continue to do so others are doing that as well when that's not, not alone in that there are other broadcasters doing great jobs with women's sport too but it does need a push there's no doubt it's coming from a position where it, it has not had the prominence uh, that the men men's sport have but it's getting there and it's improving all the time. There's there's still some way to go. We definitely want to play a part in that. Others do too, and that's good because as, as, as you say, that means there will be there will be more competition in this in this area. And and um I think that's healthy. And you know, and and you know, we want to see women's sport carry on growing the way it does. I just wanted to just quickly, um, if I can just pick up um because yeah. uh, on the Olympics point, actually Andrew made some really good points about that. And and um but just because obviously there was a reason amount of noise around. Uh, the coverage, we think in the end, it's up to the IOC and the discovery how they part with those rights. And you know, the BBC, we felt, did our best to get the, the best deal we could out of that alongside a game. We talked about this mixed economy, how it works, and Andrew talked well about that too. But it's just worth noting some of the facts on this, which can get lost in some of the media noise. There wasn't, you're right, there was media noise. Audiences less so actually in terms of actual audience response of what was what was being shown and available i think andrew's right we can both discovering the bbc we can both work better in terms of how we navigate people to it that's a key point i think for future for the next olympics coming up but the fact of the matter is um in rio when the bbc did have everything 96 percent of those who consumed the olympics only watched it on bbc one so you know there's it, it you know people should recognize this there's a there's a huge number of people who are just watching the main event part of the olympics there is a, there is obviously a minority who want it all and wanted it all free to wear and couldn't find it and so forth and and quite understandably were were not pleased as we said there's better ways of how we can convey that message perhaps um but that's really significant and even and here uh, in the tokyo olympics over 90 percent um of those who consume the olympics watched it on on BBC TV as well through BBC One and iPlayer. And again, the comparative figures are interesting. Beijing, which is the last sort of similar time zone, 2008, was watched, um, the reach there was just over 37 million. And, uh, and Tokyo, the reach was just over 36 million. And that's 13 years of very substantial changes in the TV environment, but yet actually very similar numbers viewing it. So look, we, we get the point of some individuals not being happy with, um, with with how they can access this and how we can better relay that, as, as both Andrew and I have said. But the fact of the matter is, it was very well accessed. And that's, that's, that's not counting, very significantly, over 100 million online viewing requests on the BBC. And as Andrew said, obviously, um, some very substantial figures for discovery too. So, you know, we do understand why there were, uh, why there was some degree of satisfaction, but I think that needs to be put in the context of the fact that, that we think, well, in fact, the evidence shows the vast majority of those consuming the Olympics do appear to be satisfied and do appear to have been able to access it properly. Okay. Um, right. There is a part of me that wants to, actually, I do still really want to ask this question. Um, <laughs> as I was thinking, you know, but Eddie, you, you've been a driving force for women, women's boxing. Um, and, and I wanted to talk about, you know, obviously like, you know, women's, women's football, something that we always really go on about, but you've been a driving force for women's boxing. What's been the strategy behind this? And, and what do you think is next? Do you think we're going to see more of it on TV? Um, well, firstly, you know, going back to Dawn's comments, I think she's absolutely right. And, you know, I have two daughters and from a parenting mm -hmm. perspective of inspiring a younger generation, I do feel that a lot of the behavioural trends that we see amongst the younger generation, which is quite frustrating as a parent, to be quite honest with you, I feel <laughs> that sport is the answer in terms of 
discipline, respect, manners, you know, understanding winning and losing, working as a team, mental health, physical health in so many different ways. And I think the growth of women's sport, particularly women's football, is so good to inspire that, that younger generation of, of, of girls and women because they, they haven't seen that. They haven't seen, you know, girls or women get the accolades, get the coverage. Yes. They haven't seen as many superstars emerge as they should do. So it's great for them to have role models, which I think as a parent is great as well. I think from a, from a rights holder, uh, and when we talk about women's sport, I do feel that a couple of years ago, there was an element from broadcasters of, oh, it's something we should be doing. You know, it's, it's something that I think is a good look. And, you know, I, I, that's, that's my honest opinion. But I think over the years, it's developed into a very valuable set of TV rights. And also the quality has improved significantly at the elite end of women's sport. And I think that's important because I don't feel that we should just be covering sport necessarily that, that you know, isn't elitist in a respect of broadcasters should just say, oh, yeah, let's let's put some women's sport on because that's that's a good look for us. No, let's <laughs> put women's sport on because it's quality, you know, because it's high level, because these are outstanding athletes. And that was really how we started in women's boxing. And then it was when Katie Taylor, you know, Olympic world champion, the trailblazer, you know, she was the one who forced the IOC to get women's boxing onto the, the, the roster and, and into the Olympics. And she came into my office and, and we, we, we looked at women's boxing. There wasn't a huge demand um, and, you know, from broadcasters at that time. And Katie Taylor just came in at the right time. She inspired me and I followed her dream and I wanted to fight for her and give her the opportunity. Sky, who were our broadcaster at the time, you know, supported that. And we've gone from it being, you know, really a, a kind of like a, just a one-off event to have a female fight to at least one or two female fights on the card. And we saw that on Saturday night at our event at Madison Square Garden. There was two women's fights on the card. And now you look at the growth of women's boxing as well. Look at the Olympics again this year, Lauren Price winning gold on the BBC, Caris Artenstall winning silver in the BBC and before her, you know, Nicola Adams. So many great female fighters. I think that it's a big part of what we do now, but it's now sitting there in its own right and its own merit, not because it's it's a good look for matrimony. It's something yeah. we should do. Absolutely. The fights, the fights are outstanding. The entertainment is outstanding. And the great thing about it is, is although we're still playing catch up, as Dawn said, when we look at the commercial value of those fights and the money that is being generated for those fighters, we're, we're, we're getting there. You know, it doesn't mean not every female fight is as valuable as a male fight. But now you're talking about female fights that are driving audience, driving subscriptions, putting bums on seats, you know, driving uh, ticket revenue. And therefore, for us, that's what really gives us longevity across women's sport. Not something that we feel we should do, but it's getting there on its own merit, which, which is really good news for women's sport because it, it means that, as I said, it's going to have longevity as a product. Uh, Eddie, if I, sorry, I mean, if I could just come in on that, I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't agree anymore. I think it's also really, again, another compelling commercial reason for being interested in women's sport. If I just look at football, 16 to 30 year old women are more likely, um, or sorry, 16 to 30 year old male or women are more likely to watch Women's Super League uh, as a percentage. So it's sort of 35% are, are a younger audience compared to I think it's 24% of Premier League. So there's a, there's a, there's a compelling commercial reason as well um, that the, you're attracting younger audiences um, with women's football across a piece but if I can just sort of, can I just broaden this a little bit and I and um and I'm, I don't want to make us it's sort of continuing the points that we've talked about but I want to go back to sport in school because one of the big issues I think is um the education system in this country um and particularly if you look at primary education you get a teacher who has it was with the same class all the way you know, for, for a whole year and they only get four hours of training in PE and when you leave primary school to go into senior school, you expect to be able to be numerate and literate, but you also should be physically active too. So yeah. I think sport needs to be better prioritised and funded within schools and actually isn't. And then when you get to secondary school, we know that sort of your, many of your, um, uh, you know, um, interest proclivities have already been determined by your primary school education. And we see a massive drop off um, in young girls playing sport and opportunity to play sport. And actually, Maybe it should be mandated more. And we're just seeing that sort of 
key stage four, I think it is, where the 14 to 16 year olds uh, are, where you, where you think you'd want your children, your young people to be active, just aren't, because it's being, it's devalued in the school curriculum, where sports should be right up there, along with, I said, being humor, being literate, and for all the reasons that Hetty outlined is, is you know, a, a healthy physical person who participates in team sport is not only going to do better in life, but they're also going to be more engaged in sport too. Um, uh, and so that has got to be a, somehow or other, the government needs to be spending more money on sport and sport in schools. Uh, I think it's incumbent on all of us to, to at every opportunity to, to bang that home to this government. Yeah, I mean, I, I love sports. And then and then when I look at the new generation, you know, my nephews and nieces, they love it more. But we're so busy watching it at home that nobody's out there actually, you know, taking part in it, uh, which moves us on nicely to sports, right? And how that's evolved over time and the cost, really. It's all about the money, right? So how has the cost of sports rights evolved over time? And with the introduction of the streaming giants, how did the traditional broadcasters compete with their deep pockets? So we've seen the growth of um, SVOD services, you know, Amazon, Netflix, Disney, DAZN, obviously. What does the future hold for live sports coverage for more traditional broadcasters? Is it harder than ever for PSBs to pick up major sports rights? Um, Philip, I, I think, you know, you would be the best person to, to come to for this. It's obviously very competitive, but it has been for a long time. And again, I've, I've been saying throughout this, there's a mixed economy which we think works pretty well. And 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 it's in the end, it's obviously up to rights holders. There is the list of events um, uh, 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 legislation, which we think is important, but it's it's pretty much up to rights holders as to where they want to put their rights. And they look at a number of factors. They will always tell you. Obviously, money is clearly a factor. You know, these are these are businesses, and everybody needs to understand that. And and um, that's been well made by others on this call. Um, but there's also reach and there's um, uh, what you can deliver. And, 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 you know, we think the BBC has got a big part to play in that. We know we have to pay the right price as well, whether it's a listed event or not for these events too. So um, thus far, and, you know, we, we, we continue to fight the good fight. And, and for all the fact there's, you know, a growing number of, of entrants and, and, and increased competition to a degree, we feel the BBC's held its own. You look at this year and the next year, you mentioned about the, obviously the Euros, the Olympics we've had this year. You know, next year alone in 2022, we have a Winter Olympics, um, uh, the Commonwealth Games, the World Athletics Championships, European Championships, the Rugby League World Cup, the Football World Cup. Those are all on free to air TV. There are other events on free to air TV, not on the BBC. That, that's excluding the annual events like Wimbledon Six Nations, which we renewed this year. Uh, Premier League pilots, which we renewed this year as well. Wimbledon's been extended this year too. So we do think the BBC is holding its own position on that and retaining those key events of national significance, which we think the BBC should be showing, or at least should be on free to air. And obviously, ITV, Channel Four, others do um, uh, uh, play their part in that as well. So the answer is yes, it's extremely competitive. Yes, it's it's getting increasingly competitive in, to some degree. The rights market fluctuates and others will talk about that, no doubt, um, depending on a whole variety of factors. Um, but it remains very strong. The wish to watch live sports, to consume live sports to a degree bucks the sort of overall trend of, of, of TV viewing, which is on a sort of a gentle decline. Not always so gentle, but but um, uh, the fact is with big sporting events, people do come to those in large measures. There's an increasing number of courses who are actually consuming stuff digitally. We think it's really important with the list of events legislation that's up to date, both in terms of doing what it should do, which is making sure that it, um, it does guarantee that for those real events of national significance, they are available to the widest possible audience on public service service broadcasters. But also there's, you know, clearly because of the way that's consumed, those events are consumed digitally, that needs to be factored into, in, into, into that process too, very importantly. Um, but with all that backdrop, I think, as I say, the BBC thus far is, is holding its own well in, in, that, in that tough environment. It's a tough environment and it's um, it's a very competitive environment and we understand that and and we know there are factors in there, including absolutely financial ones, which sometimes will um, cause us, you know, headaches. But um, that's the fact of life of, of dealing with a very, very popular sport and great output, which people want to watch. Andrew, how does Discovery compete in this space? 
Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a very open <laughs> question. Um, I, I would say as a starting point to that conversation, that the, the value of sports rights is 100% driven by competition. Let, let, let's, just, let, let's just level set in terms of what really drives the value of sports rights. It, it, it remains one of very few genres of content that can meaningfully move an audience on demand, right? It's a appointment to view, it's a live value content, which means everyone who has the content knows that they're going to get a certain level of audience. The, the level depends on the competitiveness of the event, the local hero, any number of different factors. But sports content it is valuable because it guarantees a tune-in audience at a particular time on a particular day. And that has always been used by new entrants to, to take market share. And, and taking market share drives competition, competition drives value, and we find ourselves in a situation like what we had in the UK between BT Sport and Sky, where that value continued to grow. If that competition dissipates, then rights value changes. The role of a rights holder in that environment, of course, is to make some decisions about what they want for their sport. Do they want to take as much money off the table as possible? Back to Eddie's point, you know, we have, you know, as a, if you're a rights holder, you have a duty to maximize value, to be able to share within your sporting pyramid to all the constituents that survive off the rights fees that, you know, broadcasters pay. Yeah, to a certain degree, you, you have to take the money, but you, you've got to strike a balance between what you're trying to achieve. If you're an emerging sport, trying to maximize value by putting yourself behind a very narrow narrow paywall versus a broader paywall can suffocate your sport before you've even begun. Um, so, you know, seeking free to wear partnerships and prioritizing coverage. Um, and again, the other comment I would make is free to wear partnerships that, you know, digital free and free to wear are two different things, but that we often don't talk about digital free either. Ubiquity of accessibility does not mean it has to be on free to wear. It can mean it's uh, in front of a paywall. It can be on any digital platform. So we've got to think about what free means in terms of being able to offer the content um, to a broader audience. But f for me, it, it is always challenging entering a competitive marketplace for sports rights. As discovery goes, we've made a very conscious decision that we really like the hand that we've been dealt with in terms of the multi-platform approach. We have free-to-air platforms in most of the major European markets, whether it be you know Quest in the UK, um, whether it be you know Canal Five in Sweden or the Nordics, whether it be TVN in in Poland, whether it be Dmax in in Spain and in Italy. We have large scale local free-to-air networks that work very well in partnership with Eurosport, which is a, you know, sports only cable network together with Discovery Plus, where we've chosen to not be a pure play sports um, OTT provider, but to aggregate all of our content on one platform, because we believe that creating scale is the priority at the moment and will remain the priority for some period of time, that putting all of our content on one platform, aggregating audiences and creating scale in an OTT environment is really important. So as Discovery looks at our capability, we can actually be a one-stop shop for most rights holders where we say, actually, we can provide you free-to-air coverage, we can provide you broadly distributed you know, Eurosport cable coverage, and we can provide you digital coverage across all of our OTT platforms. So we're one of few broadcasters that can actually tick all the boxes of a rights holder in one place versus having to um, do a deal between, let's say, BBC and Sky or ITV and Sky, where you have to figure out the packaging with two separate parties, get them both aligned and back to the table. That, that's a more difficult proposition, we think, for a rights holder than coming to us and saying, you know what, we can actually do everything we need to do with, with one partner. Yeah, I, I do see your point with having that one partner. But obviously, it's great picking up on your point about competition drives and everything. This is surely great for you, Dawn and Eddie. More competition means more money for your sports. Eddie, can you tell us about the recent DAZN deal you struck, moving fights from Sky? Um, was that an easy decision to make? Uh, no, it wasn't. I mean, you know, when, when you talk across our business of, of sports, um, variation is is quite nice to have at times for specific sports. I mean, you know, across our snooker, of course, we have a, a long-standing deal with the BBC, also events shown across ITV, Discovery as well. 
you know, and across our darts, a long-standing deal with Sky, but also coverage across ITV and, and previously with BBC as well. So that's a very nice mix to have as a rights holder. In boxing, it, it, it's a different kind of sport. I think it's at a different kind of stage. We did a, a big deal with the zone in the US, um, which saw us staging 16 events a year in America. And DAZN, who are obviously very aggressive in a number of key markets, had a plan to almost create a global platform for boxing, which was very unique. So wherever I am in the world, the message is very simple to fight fans. DAZN is where you watch match from boxing. It doesn't matter what country you're in, it's accessible. And, and traveling with that kind of global plan is difficult when you've got 100 hats on for different broadcasts. Okay, we're, you know, we're in we're in Germany and we've got our individual broadcaster here or we're in Australia, we've got Fox. And yeah. it was a very unique situation for us with this global platform for the zone. It's never been done before across boxing. Obviously we've been with Sky for, for many, many years and it was a big success. But you know the, the global vision of the zone and of course the rights fees that they were willing to pay to create these major fights and create this incredible global schedule, which was for us as a business, um, you know, it was too compelling. And for our fighters as well, we would essentially be turning our, our back on an opportunity of a huge budget to make great fights and to pay these guys incredible purses for being in a very, very dangerous sport. And the vision from DAZN in that respect was was great. And also Sky's vision was, was very pay-per-view focused for boxing. So although there was a rights fee pot for fights, the main vision for boxing was to make money. And that was to come through a kind of additional paywall, if you like, of pay-per-view. So a lot of pressure that we were under from fight fans was, okay, you know, we're, we're a Sky subscriber, but you're also asking us to pay additional uh, money for pay-per-view on top of our monthly subscription. And I spent years fighting with the consumer on that. And I, I did get a little bit tired <laughs> of it. So it was nice to sort of create a, a cheaper offering, if you like, for fight fans to take those pay-per-view events off pay-per-view, although some will still exist there, when you talk about Joshua and Fury and put them on a subscription model that we really believe in. And for us as a business now, we, we now sit across probably 50 fight nights a year across markets with the zone that they're investing in, in localized events, you know, America, UK, Mexico, Italy, Spain, Australia about to launch, Germany. And our plan for the boxing business is a true global look and, and the zone with a perfect partner to make that a reality. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think you've covered most of that, to be honest with you, when it comes to this. Uh, I wanted to ask, obviously, we've we've covered boxing and, and how that's moved. And, and we all love football. It's obviously my interest in what I work in. And I want to come to, there's an audience poll. So we will have that now. And I'll ask you this question. So the English Premier League announced that it agreed to roll over its 5.1 billion deal with Sky, Amazon, BBC and BT Sport for UK rights for two years until 2024-25. This meant that the rights did not go up for auction. But who do you think got the better deal here? A, the broadcasters, the price was only ever going to go up. Or B, the Premier League, the asset is overpriced and is surely going to go down in price. So you tell us that. Please only choose obviously one. <laughs> I'd like a third option, which is they both got a great deal. Ah, oh, so you think it's a score draw? You think that? Okay, well, this is this is interesting. <laughs> well, obviously, I don't know what else. We have to. We obviously will see what happens now. But let's. You know, while we wait for those results, let me ask you, the facts tell us that, you know, we, we spoke a lot about Generation Z and um, the facts tell us that the new generation will not consume sport in the same way as those before them, such as millennials who consume sport the most. Social media has changed the way that sports and sports styles are now covered. You talked about this, Eddie, and you did as well, Dawn. Um, and obviously now those new stars are being promoted and covered in different day, in different ways. How are you looking to get this new generation on board and engaged with, with all aspects of the sport? And is it worthwhile? Eddie, Anthony Joshua has a huge profile amongst young people in the UK, but many of them won't have ever seen him fight live. Does, does that matter? Because they'll find other ways of finding him? Yeah, I think I think that's, a, you know, the final point there was, was important. I think, you know, that, that younger generation of audience might not 
traditionally watch uh, you know, a, a PBS or a linear a broadcast, a terrestrial broadcast sorry, of, of sport. And if you look at what the BBC are doing, which I think they're doing so well, is growing that reach across iPlayer, you know, across BBC Three, across other platforms that engage that younger audience in terms of the way that they're looking for and digesting content. So I think that when you look at the growth of Anthony Joshua, the money he's made, the brand that he's built, I don't think the lack of, uh, of uh, terrestrial coverage has affected his earnings or his profile or his, you know, his audience in, in a sense that we know the numbers that are produced and, and there's all, all kinds of ways for people to watch, you know, whether that's to watch live, whether that's to watch across YouTube, across the broadcaster's uh, YouTube platform and digital platforms the next day. There, there are millions and millions of people watching his fights globally. Yeah. Um, but we, we do also appreciate that behind the pay-per-view offering, you will limit the audience, but you'll also generate um, you know, huge income for, for to, to create those fights that the public want to see. So um, I think that no one denies as a rights holder the, the value that, that uh, a PBS can bring. Um, but it's just in case the case of getting it right. I go back to earlier in an ideal scenario. And that's a great thing about working with some um, very smart and very open minded um, subscriber based platform like the zone who don't have an issue in whether it's sharing highlights or whether it's sharing content or whether it's maybe sharing some live rights with with a, a, a BBC or another broadcaster because they understand the process. They understand it and maybe the same with Andrew as well, you know, they, they know the value that that can bring. Some broadcasters you've worked with in the past might be, no, we don't want them to have any access to that. Oh, no, they can't have the radio rights coverage. No, 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 we, we actually see that very differently. And, and I think now the digital offering, particularly when you look at BBC, you know, that, that is becoming a massive part of the business and a, and a big way in which that younger generation consumes sport and content. No, I think it's it's more it's more than just either or, right? These are complementary platforms. I come in, I come back to the kind of original comment I made, which is there are different audiences consuming content on these platforms now. So the idea that just by having your content on an OTT platform like a Discovery Plus is sufficient to attract the maximum audience and somehow you might be compromising your audience because you have a highlights on a free-to-air network, I, I think is just a bit old school thinking in terms of how audience quite frankly behave. Audience want to consume the content on the platforms they're used to consuming it on. The idea that you're going to move audiences massively from free to air to streaming in, in short order, I think is a bit naive, quite frankly. And, and it's actually the reverse for us. We see the, the absolute need to have access to free to air broadcast to help promote audiences and, and awareness around what we might have on digital because we know that digital platforms by their definition, especially behind a paywall, are narrower. So you, 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 you absolutely need to be able to use free-to-air megaphones to tell people where to go and watch if they want to watch more than what you've got on those platforms, whether it be highlights, whether it be you know one match a day or one match a week or one match a month, whatever it might be, the free-to-air partnership with an OTT platform, I, I think is hugely valuable and, and I think creates awareness and creates an overall rising tide for that viewership. Philip's got the best example of that I think ever match of the day for Sky. I mean, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant promotion. For, actually, you want to watch the matches in their entirety. Significant majority are, are on Sky, and it, it is a brilliant show in and of itself. Works perfectly. I mean, I, I, I think the point Andrew's made a couple of times about both and is really important. You know, they, they, we should not be in some narrow spectrum where you have to make sure people aren't making choice. Well, they are making choice, actually, but that's the point. So, you know, you need to be able to offer across the piece. We're acutely aware of your younger audiences are going, which is not to linear TV. So, and, and therefore, you absolutely need to maximise the value that we can provide on digital and social. And uh, everybody is. And, and that's just where, obviously, young audiences, are, they're, they're, they're younger people are actually spending their time in terms of media. So, you know, you just got to recognise that. And therefore make sure that whatever you're doing takes that into account and um, it's really important that we that we stretch out what we're doing in that area and, and really concentrate on the area just worth noting i know we're running out of time though that 
those big events, ironically, some of which we've been talking about, are the, are the, <laughs> it's part of the sort of same equation or the sort of virtual circle, if you like, virtual circle. The reason why they are so expensive and why they're so competitive over is they do attract enormous audiences wherever they are, yeah. indeed, whether that's digital or you know, whether that's paid platforms or linear. And as a result, you get incredible audiences. So like 25 million watch the Euros final on the BBC on the same day as nearly 8 million watch the Wimbledon final. Huge numbers of young people watch those. So the sporting events of that size still do attract young audiences to actual linear TV. But as, as others have said, it's, it's, not, it's not either or, it's that, that is great, but then you need to supplement that or actually put alongside that what the digital offering that is and indeed what people are saying here, what can be played out across partnerships and with uh, collaborations with other broadcasters too. So you heard it, enormous audiences, and we've got the results of the audience poll back. We asked you who is getting the best out of the deal, who got the better deal, the broadcasters. Oh, it's very tight. Um, like and everyone, <laughs> yeah, everyone's gone. 54% have chosen the Premier League. The asset is overpriced and is going to go down in price. Oh, thoughts on that? I don't I'm with Dawn. I think Dawn got it right. I think it was, you know, I think it, I think it worked well. For, you know, obviously unique circumstances post pandemic. Yeah. Um, it took a lot of involvement well, government, very helpful as well. And I know with the Premier League in terms of working out through and broadcasters. So I'm sure it won't be repeated. But um, uh, in this particular instance, I think it made a lot of sense. I think that was the key for that deal. I mean, everyone's got to remember it was done in a COVID environment where you had broadcasters really in a massive state of uncertainty about what was going to happen in the immediate short term. And again, you can't you can't forget that the entire football pyramid is dependent on this broadcast deal. So creating the certainty for both the broadcasters and the Premier League, it was a win-win for both sides, for sure, in my view. Well, yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, let's go to the audience because we've gotten some interesting questions, so many interesting ones. Um, unfortunately, we can only choose one or two. Um, let's go to the first one. Now, the focus from broadcasters team to still be on high profile sports like football, rugby, boxing. Should there be more to help increase to increase minority sports? Um, I, I guess the question is to you, the panel, would you take more punts on these mi minority sports? Well, we, well, I mean, sorry, I'll, I'll jump in really quickly. I mean, we, we do all the time. I mean, one of the benefits of being a pure play sports broadcaster like Eurosport in this regard is that we can we can give oxygen to many more sports than a free-to-air broadcaster can. So what, one of the things that I think, and Philip, you'll talk to this, I'm sure, is at the end of the day, there is a limit to how much sport any one free-to-air broadcaster can put on their platform. Uh, and, you know, it, it's tough to make it wall-to-wall -wall sport. So th there is a role for organizations like Eurosport or like Discovery Plus and others who, who have unlimited capacity to put, you know, emerging sports alongside more established sports and create visibility in an audience. So we, we do that as business as usual, as far as I'm concerned. I think that's absolutely right, and also to say that uh, certainly if you're talking about the the, the channels, uh, you know we, we we're not we're not we don't have sports channels, so clearly they're they're, they're serving multiple genres, and sport has to fight for its place, and understandably, but we do have a very strong digital offering, and our streaming offering um, is is available. Obviously, think areas like Discovery, and indeed the other sports pay 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 platforms are too, but our streaming platform is definitely available. It has taken up thousands actually of hours. Uh, of of extra sports since we started um, widening its uh, it, its possible approach, so that is an area where you will get week in week out a really big variety of of those sports. And you know, as with everything else, depending on how the interest grows, then there has the opportunity for those to grow and perhaps find their space um, on, on onto a linear channel. But um, but yes, that there is a limit to what space there is on 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 free-to-air channels, which are multi-genre. But as I say, we we do provide that service on our streaming platform, which which continues to allow a huge a huge variety of sports to um to to air. Okay. Um. The next question, which I think is an interesting one, is: Should the listed events be ended or at least significantly revised? And what would be their suggestions for revision? I'm going to go first. 
I mean, interest. Interest. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> guess what my answer is. Yeah, yeah. As, as have a guess. Go on, no. I think you should go first. <laughs> <laughs> guess what I'm going to say. We, I, I, I've said it earlier in the call, actually. I think it's really important. I mean, again, I knowledge, I keep saying this, there's a mixed economy. There's a lot of sport, which is absolutely um, um, free to be competed for. Huge amount. There's more sport being aired in this country than ever before. It's growing all the time. Quite right that there's competition uh, across the weeks. There is indeed on the list of events, just to be clear, uh, between the free to airs, that, and that's getting more active. Um, but we do think, you know, at the start of this call we talked about, we do think there's a really important part, point to protect events of national significance to make sure that it's not just um, the money that will necessarily win it. Um, we still have to pay. There's a very clear point in the list of events about paying a fair price, by the way. It's very clear legislation. So we do think it's important. And just briefly, because I'm running out of time, I don't want to go on too much. I mentioned earlier as well, it does need to be, the revision I think it's quite complicated is just about eligibility. And we think it's important that the principle of that being what it was meant to be, which is public service broadcasters with the maximum reach, I think should still apply. And we also think it's important to address how that works digitally and how and how sports that such sports are accessed digitally. Again, we understand the wider context, We're not trying to deprive <laughs> other competitors of their position in that too. But we think that's an important point to note as it's as it's um, reviewed. I, I might I might just provide a slightly different point of view <laughs> <laughs> on, on that one. Look, there, there's got to be an acknowledgement that free, um, accessible content for the broader British public does not necessarily mean it has to be on a free-to-air network. No, we're living in, we live in an age where di digital accessibility is now ubiquitous in the UK. Now, people may not enjoy having to use their technology in order to watch this content, which I could sympathise for a certain portion of the population. But I think we've got to be careful that it, it is acknowledged that the listed events is a distortion of a you know completely open market. It does distort the conversation that happens between the rights holder and the market because it, it effectively creates a priority um, in terms of what can be discussed. And I think that is a distortion. But, um, you know, the accessibility point needs to be distinguished from a free-to-air network point. And I, and I think that that's one of the key things that I would just leave people with. Anyone else want to come back on that? No, ah, good. good summation. As a citizen, I can understand why actually it's not the, I, the notion of listed events are a fine thing to have. As a rights holder, I'm not so sure. Uh, yeah, I guess it all depends on the point of view that you have. But I think that is the end of our session. Thank you to all the viewers who joined us today and for all the wonderful questions that, that you provided. Thank you to our fantastic panel of speakers, Philip, Andrew, Dawn and Eddie. Eddie, by the way, is a New York. He was trying to show you that, but he's had to cover yeah. it up with the curtain. So <laughs> it's too much sunshine over there. Thank you to the RTS and particularly to Jamie O'Neill for supporting and organizing the event. And I would also like to personally thank our producer for today's event and a man who helped bring us all together and provide all the necessary information and handholding that I've needed along the way. Thank you to David and Murdio. Thanks for all for joining us and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Hi all, thanks a lot.